which is the biological small angle scattering group within EMBL, the European Molecular Biology Lab Laboratory here in Hamburg. He studied physics at the Moscow State University in Russia and did his PhD at the NRC Kurchatov Institute, also in Russia, where he focused on condensed metaphysics. So he basically already dealt back then with X-rays. I'm very happy um, that he's here today to share his passion and work with us on how X-rays can actually help in understanding and fighting disease. So Andre, the stage is yours if you want to. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me well. We do. Thank you. Okay, good. So thank you for introduction and thank you for inviting me to uh, for, for having this opportunity to present uh, the stuff that we are doing in Hamburg. And uh, yes, and with this, I, I want to additionally introduce myself. <laughs> um, as I put in my um, uh, prof a Twitter profile that I'm physicist in love with biochemistry. And it is actually <laughs> true because I started, uh, well, my mom is a chemist. So I always like to, uh, always like to, to do some science scientific stuff. And I was very happy to hang around in the lab back in the days when I was quite small. And I was fascinated with chemistry and was trying to read her books. Like uh, for those who know, it was Leninger, Principles of Biochemistry. I really liked the pictures there and I tried to understand the, uh, what is written. But well, life went a bit different direction and I've uh, decided to study physics in the Moscow State University. But I kept my love for chemistry and uh, biochemistry since then. And one of the chemical uh, experiments that I really liked uh, back then, it's uh, called Vulcano on the table. It's the oxidation of the uh, ammonium bichromate. And uh, this is basically how I thought, wow, so cool. It would be nice to know how the science of this works. Okay, enough of formulas. And I uh, well, actually, it's quite nice to see the list of participants. So a lot of familiar faces. And uh, sorry if I bother you with a real down down sampled science part. But uh, yeah, let's see how it goes. It would be first experience for me. Um, and uh, let's talk first about the iceberg in the room. <laughs> It means that they actually most of the stuff that has been presented on scientific talks is just the tip of the iceberg. And what we are usually do not present is the work that's done uh, behind that. All of uh, test experiments, uh, calibration, uh, calibration and uh, uh, failed attempts because of some unknown factors like the color of the socks or the face of the moon. And uh, of course, it's all done always with, in collaboration with other people. And here I'm presenting only like as a talking head of, uh, what, of science, what I've been involved personally or what we've been involved at EMBL uh, in, the, in the recent days. Uh, and uh, sometimes as a scientist, you feel yourself a bit overwhelmed with the problems and the experiments doesn't work. But at the end, you realize that as all small buggers, uh, the work uh, is nicely paid off and you can solve, uh, the, um, sol solve your scientific question at the end. Okay, let's go to the first part, which would be the physics part. And... Um, the topic of the talk was mentioned, uh, X-rays were mentioned and they were discovered uh, in like in 1895-96 uh, as a strange radiation coming from, uh, from uh, high voltage tubing. It's made by Wilhelm Konrad Röntgen. In English, it's called uh, X-rays, in Russian and German, Röntgenstrahlung. Uh, and, uh, the fun fact, when I was preparing this presentation, I was searching for the famous head, hand of the, uh, of the wife of Röntgen. And the first uh, picture that I come up with, it was a hand of the, another, uh, another person. And I thought, oh no, I had a mistake in the description uh, that I submitted for the print of science, but no, all good. 
apparently Rangan did two pictures. The first one was uh, from his wife as a first test experiment. And the second one, which is uh, a bit more, looks a bit more nice in a sense of high resolution and stuff, it's made for publication. And I found this quite funny because nothing has changed since then. And as mentioned, test experiments sometimes do not make into publication. But in this case, uh, both of them are well known to the, uh, to the society. Okay, this was a strange, uh, strange radiation that one cannot see, but they can penetrate uh, different objects. And this had been used later, uh, further down the road in 60s. Uh, the pat scattering pattern, uh, which is produced by DNA, uh, was collected by Rosalind Franklin. And here on uh, top, uh, you can see it. this is a picture on the uh, photographic paper uh, allowed Watson and Crick later to realize that this can, kind of pattern is very specific for the helical structure. And this gave the um, basically the pivotal point for uh, structural biology and understanding that the DNA, uh, the uh, basics of, of life, is, has a double uh, helical structure. And um, basically since then, the uh, story continues and we still use uh, X-rays to shine to proteins in solution and then crystals to obtain this fancy, uh, fancy, fancy scattering patterns with a lot of dots to uh, realize how does, this, uh, how does the atoms are arranged in 3D space. And a little bit more on that uh, later in the presentation. Okay, so we use X-rays to look at small things and um, the most important property of, uh, of X-rays is that it has a wavelength. So X-rays are electromagnetic radiation as the light that we see, but the only difference is that the visible light has a wavelength around five, 600 nanometers, whereas the X-rays are uh, way, way, way smaller to the size around uh, tens of the nanometers. And the way of saying uh, one tenth of nanometer is one angstrom, and uh, conveniently enough, this is a typical distance between atoms in the crystal structures, which is quite nice. And this is the main property which we use uh, to study crystal structures. We shine X-rays on them and see how does the structure bend, bend the incoming X-rays. And it's possible because the wavelength is a, a tip of the typical distance between these atoms. This is a general uh, physical property. Okay, so how small is small, these nanometers and angstroms? We are in Germany now, and we have a Spargel season. So everyone can imagine how does a uh, Spargel looks like. And well, I googled it, and the typical size of the Spargel is around 20, 30 centimeters. And if you compare it with a, uh, with a distance to the moon, this would be 10 to the 9 times more. And this could give you the idea between the difference of uh, sizes uh, uh, in, in comparison. So one nanometer and one angstrom is very, very, very small uh, indeed. Um, yes, this. Uh -huh. Good. So we know about X-rays and now we are going to talk about the scattering and Basically, what we do, we shine uh, X-rays on a crystal structure or also a uh, solution, and uh, we detect at which angle we see the radiation that scatters around these crystals. And in such a way, uh, uh, we use a 2D detectors to have uh, to have a muster of the different dots and the way these dots are arranged onto this structure, uh, to the picture, uh, allows us to know how, how does the 3D organization of atoms in a, the, such a huge molecules uh, look like. And um, it should be noted that all these fancy pictures in the textbooks of uh, bi biochemistry are produced mostly using the X-ray scattering. And for... Uh, <laughs> Physicist in the auditorium, I, well, basically from, mostly for myself, <laughs> I included one formula that is, was uh, first found by uh, father and son Bragg. Um, and they discovered that the, there is a very, very simple relation between the wavelengths that I mentioned before and the angle of 
for which X-rays are scattered and the distance between different crystallographic planes. And this has always fascinated me that technically it's a very small, a simple relation, but it allows us also with help of computers and computational software to determine the spatial distribution of atoms in 3D. Okay, so now we are going to the part uh, about uh, how do we get high intensity X-rays. And I decided to include this small part about Teilchen Beschleuniger. So it's a hi to all Rhinelander in the auditorium. Uh, in Rheinisch Teilchen, a small Teilchen, sorry. <laughs> it's a small piece of, uh, piece of pastry. And uh, I, I thought there should be joke about that. And indeed, there's a <laughs> Becquerel and uh, the physics guys, uh, Daisy also found this funny and we have a, a, a LKW that is going around is saying Teilchen Beschleuniger. But it's a side note, I just found this <laughs> very, very cute. And now we are going to the particle accelerators themselves. And uh, so the, before we go to the production of X-rays, I should tell, say something about the uh, physics, how it's all started. So originally accelerators has been used by, uh, by physicists to study nuclear reactions. And one of the well-known accelerators is LHC in uh, Switzerland. Well, partially in Switzerland, partially in France. It's quite long, uh, with circumference of around 27 kilometers. And uh, it's used to collide small, uh, tiny particles, which are way smaller than the atoms, to study how do they scatter. And with this, we, we could know uh, the details of how the world works, even on a smaller scale than nanometers. OK, this uh, particle physics is a bit different branch, but I will tell you how it's connected to what we are doing. Uh, physicists discovered that when you put electron or any other charged particle on a closed, uh, closed orbit and then start to accelerate it in a, circ uh, in a circular manner, it's, it, it start to produce uh, radiation. Uh, and it can be imagined like uh, flying par metal particles from the uh, cutting wheel or like the water splashing around uh, from the car going through the puddle. And originally, X-rays, this way of producing X-rays was uh, as a byproduct of accelerator physics. And as particle er emits uh, light when it rotates, it also loses the energy. So it was a ve uh, very bad effect that not allowing the physicists to study high energy nuclear reactions. And it was just by chance in 1957 uh, it, that uh, on a test run of the small accelerator here, which was transparent, the people could see that the particles shine, shine the light. In this case, it was visible, uh, visible, visible light. Uh, but then uh, after doing some calculations, uh, it, uh, it was discovered that in order to produce high intensity radiation in an X-ray regime, you need to, to build a bit bigger machines. And uh, since then, uh, many of the accelerators were rep repurposed for producing X-rays, uh, and uh, quite a number of them are built around the world. And uh, all of them has a typical feature that are quite roundish and nice and look quite fancy, actually, if you think about it. And it's, uh, it's in Taiwan, in France, in Lund, so all over the Europe and all over the world. Since it's a pint of science Hamburg, uh, I will go a bit more into detail of what accelerators we have. So on the DAISY campus in the Northwest of Hamburg, we used to have two accelerators. One is called HERA, the bigger ring here, which is uh, around six kilometers in circumference and a smaller one, which is called PETRA. Uh, it's a, a fancy German abbreviations, which basically state uh, uh, that it's uh, accelerator to accelerate particles. 
Uh, here I was de decommissioned uh, at some point, and it's not no young, longer in use for particle physics. However, pre-accelerator for this, uh, for HERA accelerator has been repurposed and basically rebuilt. So there's only tunnel there and uh, on the DAISY campus uh, in Hamburg, there, was, there were built three uh, experimental halls uh, for generating X-rays. And I'm working, as mentioned, at EMBL, European Medical Biology Laboratory, which is located just near and also in, the, in this part of the building, where we mostly focused on structural biology research. And since uh, I hope we still have time, oh, I guess we have quite some time. Uh, I will have a small pause and I prepared a short video uh, since we cannot go on the real excursion. Uh, I, I hope it can, can give you an impression of how it looks like in, inside. So let's have a quick look and I will have a small pause then. Okay. As I showed you before. Inside building. Or maybe not this one. I, I hope you can hear the now audio. Like and I need a mask. See you later. Hello again. Welcome to the bridge. Sorry, can you hear the audio or shall I reshare it? It's okay. It's okay? Okay, good. And here, as you can see, this is our beam lines. And the building is actually around. In this direction. You can see the curvature and there behind the wall is the accelerator that I was mentioning. These are basically our beam lines that we used, used for structural research. And now we are going to go a bit downstairs and I will try to show you the beam line. See you. Hi again. Welcome to our control room. So these photos I already showed you. And here you can see basically the place where we as a physicist spend most of the time. It's a lot of cool hardware and software. So, and um, yeah, that's basically our life. And here behind these doors, actually experiments are happening. So as you can see, there is no restriction now. I can open the door and we can go inside and see what's happening there. It's so cool. Welcome to the temple of science. So maybe it doesn't look that impressive at the first glance, but that's was very impressive for me when I first came here. Yeah, as, as I can sh show, was showing before, this is our, our setup. Sample changer where we put our samples and everything happens there. In this very, very small chamber. I don't know where, whether you can see it or not. Uh, like this whole huge, there's a huge machine is needed only to produce the X-rays and the actual amount of the samples and, and processing that we need is not very, very big. Also, sometimes we have to use big volumes. That's mostly buffer, so it's basically water. Okay, so I was showing before, we had this cage our detector and we need this tubing to keep the vacuum for the x-rays because it's very very absor uh, high absorbance in the air and basically inside the small tubing inside this tubing it's all vacuum so this was very nice to have you as a visitor and i hope i could show you a bit more Okay, so this was a small introduction to the Petros 3 facility that I'm working in. Um, yes, and, and I, oh, 
moment. And let's go to the second part, which is biology. And I really like this slide. Um, so for me, as a physicist, as I said, biology looks like that, mostly. Uh, but I'm eager to learn and uh, the things, well, science is a col always collaborative and thanks to my colleagues who are know much, much more in terms of biochemistry and bio biophysics, they are uh, explaining me stuff and I will try to uh, also explain for what, what I understood. So I'm not a biologist, but I will, I will try to explain how I understand what, what's happening and what kind of Bio, bioscience we are doing and how physicists are involved into this. Okay, so one of the main mantra of structural biologists is that we have uh, uh, that every, so we have a kind of uh, interplay between structure and function. The idea is that if we have, if we know the structure of protein, that uh, this fancy figure that I was showing before, then we would know the function. And uh, sometimes it's also debatable whether the function determines the structure. So it's a, a bit of two-sided question. Nevertheless, uh, the key thing is that we want to know the structure first. And this knowing the structure, like to know how the things looks like in real life allows us to uh, understand better the diseases and how to uh, fight against them. And as an example of correspondence between structure and function, here is a, uh, as we stick with the birds, uh, birds have two distinct types of feathers. One of them is very stiff, which is used for in, 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 uh, in used for flying. And another type is very fluffy and unstructured that is down feathers to keep, keep the small birds warm in winter, for example. So this this how uh, one can imagine the correspondence between structure and function. Uh, the same goes into the biology itself. So here on the left hand side is the structure of the uh, hemoglobin, which is a transport protein in blood, and we know uh, the way it works because we know the structure and these small green parts that contain uh, contain. Uh, there's the parts where the oxygen binds and uh, leaves the protein and allows us basically to function. This was the small biology part and what does a physicist do in this area? Um, it's nicely depicted by Tony Stark. We are working with accelerators in this sense and we're doing the uh, data analysis. Um, yeah, not all physicists look like that, unfortunately. And you cannot build an accelerator uh, in a, in a after, after lunch pause. So actual work look a little bit uh, more down to earth. We spend a lot of time, uh, me and my colleagues. So of course, I'm not doing this work alone. Uh, you've seen Martin already. <laughs> Uh, and, and Clemon and other people who are not uh, depicted here. And we are basically spend, spend time uh, adjusting, optimizing, and doing the actual measurements for, for, for biology. And sometimes we are also having fun. And uh, if one can, uh, when I was talking in the very beginning that you cannot see X-rays. Uh, actually, if you crank up the power of X-rays that, that we can do, uh, on our facility, you can start to see X-rays as a, as a byproduct of the um, scattering from air. So it, this is the actual X-ray beam. Uh, and why we can see it? Because the nit nitrogen in air uh, glows because of the high, high, high power and intensity. Of course, everything is happens behind the closed doors. I showed it before, so it's all safe. Don't worry. No physicist has been damaged during this operation. Okay, so what we are actually doing is a small angle X-ray scattering, so-called. And uh, instead, of, um, instead of crystals, uh, crystals uh, we use solutions. So we put a protein of interest, or rather biologists put a protein of interest in a solution, and it flows, floats around. And the important point that you don't need this 
to have the precise structure, but then you can study interactions in, in solution uh, and understand how, how, how does the protein interact between each other really, really fast. As I mentioned before, here's in the red is uh, electrons running around Petra's three ring and blue red structure is just a fancy magnet, uh, which in, in, in this point, uh, X-rays has been uh, produced. And then we are transporting them through the vacuum tubing and the set of uh, and the set of hardware to actually focus focus the beam and define it in into the solution of proteins. And in the same way as with crystals, this solution scatters uh, X rays in a very distinct manner. And the way it scatters, we detect on a 2D picture. Then we produce 1D intensity uh, curve, dependence of uh, high intensity, low intensity regions uh, from the angle. So at smaller angles, we have high intensity and so on. And then using computational method that our groups are working, uh, that our group are working, we can uh, determine the low resolution structure of proteins in solution as well as the interactions. And this would be important uh, later, later in the talk. Um, yes, so this was nice and shiny before March 2020, I think. Uh, uh, up to now, everyone knows how the virus looks like. And since then, everything went to the lockdown and uh, restricted access behind the doors, masks, and Zoom meetings, as well as we are doing now. However, uh, it doesn't stop us from doing science and research. And this, with this, we go to the third part, which are going to talk about the very hot topic currently, unfortunately. Uh, cor coronavirus and, and vaccines. So, um, quite, uh, quite in a short time after the first lockdown, uh, the colleagues in, at EMBL, Christian Love Group and the uh, guys from Karolinska Institute in Sweden, they've been uh, able to, pr to produce uh, small nanobodies, uh, which is called uh, small antibodies, which are called synthetic nanobodies and which were originally found in llamas. However, you don't need llamas anymore to produce them. You can grow them in bacteria cells, which is quite nice. And the most important stuff about these antibodies is that they can bind to specific parts of the other proteins. And here, for example, you see the small spikes on the corona, coronavirus, and these are called conventionally spike proteins. And on the very tip of the spike protein, there is a special domain that responds to the binding of the virus to the cell and is the same uh, in the same, uh, in such a manner that it can penetrate and infect the cell. And the idea is if we uh, close uh, or if you bind something else to the site of the virus, it can stop it from being active. Um, so, Christian's group has produced a lot of synthetic nanobodies and the a good thing about uh, our technique that we can uh, quite fast screen them and to determine how good are they being produced. So because, and uh, here for example, is a list of the actual experimental data that we had. So the measurements took around, uh, around one day and the data analysis took a bit longer about several days, but then after, after three days, we could know that only a small subset of synthetic nanobodies could be uh, could be potentially produced in a in a nice manner. And it's uh, in one of them, number twenty three. Well, numbers doesn't matter in this sense much. Uh, we can see that it can bind to the uh, protein of interest. So we did another experiment or well, samples been produced by, by, by the other group, but we did uh, the scattering experiment and we could actually see that these small nanobodies can bind to the protein part of the virus in a such a way so they form a complex and it means that it can be potentially used to prevent the virus from, uh, from, from activity. And another part uh, to, to see how it actually uh, looks like, there was done uh, a crystallographic, uh, the electron microscopy structure, structure, and you can nicely see that indeed, if you took look at this small spike protein, this nanobodies, uh, this uh, 
synthetic uh, antibodies can bind to the um, to the to the protein. So this could it's but I should stress this done really really fast and effective, but it's being really really far from practical applications. But at least it shows a potential uh, application of usage of uh, such nanobodies, synthetic uh, antibodies for uh, fighting coronavirus. So it was nice collaboration work. And another, uh, another in, uh, thing that we've been uh, involved in is a study of uh, li uh, liposomes. Liposomes that are used to deliver the vaccines. Uh, so or actually are a vaccine. And uh, such drug delivery systems are used not only for the uh, vaccine, but the water insoluble drugs. And the liposomes are basically a small soap bubbles, uh, size of several tens, uh, several, well, hundreds of nanometers. Remember about nanometers that we were talking before. And the idea is that we put, we take a small piece of uh, genetic material from the virus between the bilayers and then inject it into the body and teach our, uh, our immune system to recognize, to first to produce uh, proteins that are characteristic to the virus, such as spike proteins. And this allows uh, our immune system to teach itself to find real, uh, real spike proteins on the real viruses and produce uh, antibodies that can block it in the same manner that I was uh, talking before when we are talking, uh, I've been showing the small, uh, small, much smaller uh, antibodies. And uh, this, this is actually ongo ongoing research and it hasn't been started uh, when the corona started. It was, it, it's, uh, we are doing this for quite, uh, quite a long time. And uh, Martin and Clement has been uh, involved uh, very much into the producing these results. And there was several papers published that shows how one can tune uh, the such delivery systems because it's easy to create them. You basically dissolve uh, dissolve uh, the uh, dissolve uh, lipids in water, but then you need to tune them to the size of what you want to deliver and what uh, which parameters should be used and what the composition should be used. We can nicely screen and see quite fast using uh, X-ray scattering that that I was mentioning. And here, for example, you can see this uh, liposomes, how they look real in real life. You see different layers and this, um, this piece of genetic material RNAs are sitting uh, inside, inside. Good. So um, I hope it was not too fast. And uh, if so, I'm sorry, but I was trying to fit myself into a reasonable amount of time. And as I mentioned before, science is always a collaborative work. And I hope I could show you that this is just, I've been only one of the icebergs that uh, floating around in the scientific field. And uh, I thought that two take home messages uh, could be taken home. <laughs> After this talk, the first one that uh, that I learned quite in the uh, quite in a young age that uh, that nature actually doesn't know that we divide her into different categories, and I hope I can show you that no matter what science you do, it's important to just to start with something and then you can up with whatever you want. So I was thinking to become a biochemist, but it didn't happen. Nevertheless, I had enjoyed. Uh, studying physics and after all I'm working with a, in a structural biology basically and and the second one it's always collaborative so I really like this proverb that if you want to go fast you go alone but if you go far you should always go together and the last slide um, is that uh, scientific problems I usually complicated. That's why we need different approaches uh, to look at the same, at the same, uh, the same problem. So we need different views, we need different techniques, we need different people. And, uh, but after all, what is important is to understand how the world works. And I hope 
I could give you an impression that uh, how, it's, how it's done in, in real life. And with this, I would like to thank uh, um, EMBL for being such a nice place to work, Daisy, our physics guys, all the colleagues with whom I had a really, really nice discussions before Corona and during Corona and after Corona, hopefully, and uh, Pint of Science of inviting me for doing this uh, presentation, it was first experience, and to all of you who has survived until this point. And cheers, guys. Cheers, Andre, and thank you very much for this very entertaining talk. <laughs>